Um, welcome everyone um, to this event. My name is Jamal. My name is Jamal Ilyas. Um, I am the director of the Wolf Humanity Center at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, the Wolf Center is sort of the humanities center at Penn, um, and we uh, have a, always have a very active program of uh, academic events, um, artistic events, literary ones, um, etc. And our system is that we actually run the year on a theme, um, and the theme for this year is um, heritage. Uh, and so a lot of our events tend to be focused around issues of her heritage, um, and which brings us to our event today, um, which is it's called Heritage as Poltergeist, a conversation with Shazia Sikander. Uh, this is also our signature uh, lecture event uh, for the year. It's called the Dr. S.T. Lee Distinguished Lecture in the Humanities, which is, we always bring the Distinguished Lecture for this particular thing. Before I introduce our speaker today, um, first I'd like to um, acknowledge co-sponsors and uh, funding sources that we have. So this event is co-sponsored by the Penn Forum for Global Islamic Studies, um, and the Wolf Center also would like to gratefully acknowledge the generous support, first of all, of Dr. St St Stephen uh, S.T. Lee uh, Distinguished Lecture in the Humanities Fund, the Wolf Family Foundation, the Hershey Family Foundation, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, and the Office of the Dean of Arts and Sciences at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, uh, a big thanks uh, in real terms a bigger thanks go to my colleagues at the Wolf Center, uh, without whom this thing would not be happening. First of all, Sarah Varney, without whom it would really not be happening. Um, and also to Pamela Horn, Stephen Perez, and Jake Nussbaum, without whom we'd be sitting in a dark room with no sound. Um, I'd also um, like to mention, um, since we are, A, we are celebrating uh, the concept of heritage for the entire year, and we're also in a museum uh, at Penn, which has a complicated relationship recently with various issues of heritage, um, that as we celebrate these, uh, the richness of, her of heritage and its diversity, it's important that we uh, remember and acknowledge that the land on which this great university and city stand was previously called Lenape Hoking. It was the traditional homeland of the Lenape people, also called Leni Lenape, and it was taken from them by the founding figures of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania I've got an echo. Is it stop? Okay. Uh, so, and it was taken from them by the founding figures of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania using cynical treaties that were intentionally designed to deceive and rob. Uh, so, uh, that, on that note, <laughs> let me turn to our speaker today. Um, uh, uh, so Shazia Sikander is widely celebrated for expanding and subverting the modern reception of Persian, Central Asian, and South Asian miniature painting and taking it in new directions. She lifted the miniature painting off the page of the book, first in an exploration of dimensions and narrative structures, then in a lifelong exploration of medium and content. Sikander was born in Lahore in Pakistan, where she earned her Bachelor in Fine Arts from the National College of Arts, the premier art school in the country, which had been established as the Mayo School of Art in 1875, when Lahore was an important center of the British uh, Indian Empire. Um, at, the time, at, at the time when Shazia was a, was a student there, um, in large part because of this colonial legacy of the study of South Asian and Islamic art, the miniature painting was viewed as kitsch, not deserving of serious study. Sikandar uh, chose to explore this phenomenon and challenge its assumptions and impact. Her BFA thesis, um, this, which was entitled The Scroll, quite literally lifted the miniature painting off the book page and launched it into new media, themes and spaces, to such a remarkable degree that it is fair to see her as the artist who initiated the neo-miniature movement practiced by many artists today. After teaching briefly at the National College of Arts, she moved to the United States and received her Master's in Fine Arts from the Rhode Island School of Design. Then she went to Texas where she uh, finished a, uh, the core program of the Glissel School of Art at the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston. Sikander has been broadly recognized 
and awarded for her con contribution to the arts. She received a prestigious MacArthur Fellowship in 2006, the US Medal of Art in 2012, and very recently this year, the Fukuyaka Arts and Culture Award in Japan. Um, her work has been exhibited and collected internationally, including at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Whitney Museum, the Guggenheim in Bilbao, and the Asia Society in Hong Kong. A major traveling uh, retrospective exhibit of her early work opened at the Morgan Library and uh, Museum in New York in 2021 called Extraordinary Realities. And here's a book about it that you can find at bookstores near you. Um, and, uh, and from there it traveled to uh, the RISD Museum to Providence and uh, on in June uh, of 2020 um, is where it moved next, sorry, closed in the June of 2020 at the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston. Um, so, uh, examining ideas of language, trade, empire, and migration through anti-imperial and feminist perspectives, her paintings, video animations, mosaics, and sculptures explore gender, roles, and sexuality, cultural identity, racial narratives, and colonial and post-colonial histories. Um, and she is uh, not just an articulate and thoughtful artist, but also an insightful thinker whose ideas um, and innovative thoughts come through very well when she speaks and in her articles and interviews. So please join me in, in, in welcoming Shazia Sikander to the stage. Good evening and thank you all of you for being here. Thank you, Jamal, and I'd like to thank the Wolf Humanity Center for Heritage. Thank you. Heritage is an elusive composition in terms of whose heritage? If it is our collective traditions of art, politics, culture, language, activities, objects, monuments, then it is also our fraught relationship to the storytelling of those histories and their colonial and imperial aspects. As an artist, I want to propose that drawing, too, can be seen as heritage. Drawing allows thinking to take place. It creates an armature of research clarification of ideas, and connects thinking to gesture, to action, to practice. It also allows collaboration to foster. It can be simultaneously local and global, and a means of dialogue. Drawing implies movement in time and across formats and mediums. It's a means of imagining and bringing forms to life. Space, velocity, magnitude, direction, all essential elements inherent in the process of drawing become active in different ways through thought and action, through animation and music, by linking time-based medium to the act of thinking. Drawing need not be two-dimensional. It can easily move from the page into the third dimension, into architecture, into virtual reality, and much more. In many of my works, there is a focus on heightened movement, both literal and symbolic, such as the crossovers between representation and abstraction, text and image, glass and light, digital and hand, mosaic and animation, geometry and bodies, male and female. There are no binaries. It is the in-between space that is fecund. It suggests the unknown, the untranslatable. For me, this idea of mystery is a guiding principle, a generative project. I see it as a resistance to the expected. It slows down the consumption of each work, keeping it open-ended 
while being precise, making the viewer search for what can't be found. So this, is, this, this absence is what drew me towards Central and South Asian manuscripts and also their orient Orientalist historization in the West. So transforming miniature paintings status from traditional and nostalgic to a contemporary idiom became my personal goal. After my thesis, The Scroll, which was created in 1989 and 90, broke open the mold for what could be considered a contemporary miniature. I carried that burden as a young artist in the early mid 1990s when the Indo-Persian miniature genre was not familiar in the contemporary international art world. So this painting was a turning point in Pakistan's launching contemporary miniature and laying to rest the national debate around traditional, miniature tradi around traditional miniature's inability to engage the youth. So I started researching for the scroll painting in 1988. This is the era of military dictatorship, the Fran Park US Soviet war unfolding in the region marked by diminishing women's rights in Pakistan. So I was inspired by women, precisely. Women all around me. Pakistani women, activists, artists, poets, acti many female friends. And the protagonist in this painting is a female character. The painting reads left to right. You see the young woman stepping over a threshold symbolized as a frame. You see her taking herself and others, which is the viewer, along into a new territory, a new beginning. Her form is moving through space, restless, diaphanous, passing through time, and not being rooted in the moment that the other characters exist in. The young adult female defies bodily restrictions by becoming an elastic, transparent form, an outlier, perhaps a ghost, or a ghost-like character an unnatural form, but how it can hover between the familiar and the unfamiliar. At the end, you see her in white, perhaps painting a self-portrait. It is a triangular relationship with herself. Whose portrait is she looking at? Neither she nor the viewer can see her face. So in this work, you know, I, I had done a lot of research, uh, also through large-scale works that then allowed me to uh, come up with the particular composition. And uh, I was thinking about detail, but detail as not ornamental detail, detail as information, as space, and detail how it expands and contracts. So I looked at various traditions, Chinese scroll paintings, the Persian, Persian Safavid style of painting, even K.G. Subramanian, Hockney, Ismat Chuktai, you know, tons of information. Uh, the painting um, took me almost two years to make, sometimes 14, 18 hours a day. And um, it, it, that labor in the work was also an interesting parallel to look at the, my desire to represent domestic labor in the actual painting itself. So the um, analytical framing devices in the work were creative takes on different things that I was interested in at that time, sacred geometry in Islamic architectural spaces, how negative space creates rhythm and emotionality. And um, of course, there were visits to the Lahore Fort and other architecture, but also contemporary architecture like Nayyar Ali Dada's um, uh, are, um, architecture. There were um, films that I was looking at. Again, this is 80s, so <laughs> Alfred Hitchcock's use of suspense, Akira Kurosawa's use of multiple staged motion. So anyway, it, there, there, is, there is so much that fe fed into the painting. So in that way, I was able to examine the work and imagine elements out of it that could lead towards other thought processes. So if you look at that red fence in the background, that fence later uh, becomes almost like an editing tool, a line that can be traced 
for further disruptions, an act of identifying redactions, almost like this red tool of, of uh, editing. But um, this idea of, of taking the line out of that uh, scroll allowed me to really think outside of the aspects of the, of the manuscript tradition, but again, in parallel to it, in, in thinking you know, um, that I could move just like the, the diaphanous character in and out of these different traditions. So here I wanted to just show some other forms, the cage-like form, which, uh, which comes in this series of work as well as in Housed. So this form has a door, Perhaps a pink heart lurks inside. And here I think the iconography was tapping into my anxiety of being boxed into a stereotype, perhaps on behalf of a culture or a religion. And at the same time, I was also becoming aware of America's obsession with the liberation of the Muslim woman as seen in the propaganda for its proxy war in, in Afghanistan, Pakistan, especially when towards me in the US cultural space of the early 1990s. So I wanted to respond to that, to raise questions from a variety of histories and representations. So through exploring the writings of Fatima Marnisi, Edward Said, Franz Fanon, the paradox of the veil took on a deeply poignant platform. In my work, the idea is not about the object, but about unraveling the anxiety it fosters in West's imagination, sometimes rather unfairly seen as a lurking un-American or anti-American marker. So, you know, this, this awareness came that it was in the US that I became aware of the rather long history of the politicization of the veil, especially in the politics of the West, but especially in context to Europe and its colonial legacy. So it functioned as a battleground for different ideologies at times of crisis, staged unveilings in French Algeria, for example, women choosing not to wear it as per their own will or choosing to wear it as in the 1970s in Egypt as a sign of rejection of Western consumerism to mandatory veiling and public banning in certain countries. So the vested power, contradictory over time, in the shifting meaning of the form in its public debate prompted me to question, who is veiled anyways? So the protagonist here also in this work is this very androgynous form. What you see is not what you expect. Sometimes behind it, the lines, the white lines is also at closer inspection, there's sometimes a male under the white lines. So, um, in, especially here in this particular work where you can see the before and after on the right. So the use of white was also my referencing the foundational element of the gad rang, the opaque color technique in the manuscript painting. White is used as the body, quote unquote, for all colors. Using white paint, as an editing tool to write with, literally and conceptually, I was playing on this idea of redaction and who gets to define the other in the collective imaginary. So if you took a magnifying glass and looked under the painting, you would see that the character was a male character taken from the polo playing um, template. Um, so just an, just an example of how looking at the historical work, but also looking, you know, playing with Helen Sassou's idea of the écriture feminine as well, which is, translates into writing. So here I was trying as a young artist to really think about different um, histories and different heritages and different traditions and really take ownership of, of these ideas as a thinker, as an artist, as, as an artist that has the liberty, like all artists, to take from wherever. It's the process of that transformation, which I would argue that either makes or breaks the work. So over the years, for more than three decades, my commitment to miniature painting or manuscript painting has stemmed from my desire to diversify 
a predominantly Eurocentric art history and to question the entrenched organizing principles vis-a-vis -vis museums with regard to what is considered contemporary or historical. What got me deeply hooked was understanding how European colonial legacy shaped miniature painting's fate, as many South Asian manuscripts were dismembered and sold for profit during colonial occupations. So many important historical paintings of Central South Asia reside in collections at the British Museum, the VNA, Met, Royal Windsor Library, and are not accessible for most of us, even in the field, and especially for those living in South Asia, just as one example. Early exposure that I often had in the 1980s was primarily through the catalogs printed by Western Museum's exhibition catalogs. And there were just a handful that would circulate at that time. This is, of course, before internet. So um, for me, the function of art is to allow multiple meanings and possibilities, to open up space, for a more just world. So beginning in the mid 80s, the work started to pioneer a visual art form, which at that time was called contemporary miniature, but over the years became neo miniature. Grounded in extensive research of reductive visual and textual representations in 19th and 20th century colonial archives, my work aimed to remedy narrow narratives by shifting the themes around race, empire, diaspora, gender, sexuality, politics. So oftentimes, experimenting with ink, mixed media techniques, with a quick or a swiftness and an abandon, I started to look at books, the coffee table type books, a page from an example of, of the types of representations that I would see in them. And I would see these um, shadowless photographs, sometimes in all sorts of varied categories and in kind of um, not in any particular chronological or particular order. And I thought of them as little monsters that needed to escape their representations. So as I started to imagine them as wanting to escape the literally like step off the page, that gave me these ideas to develop these um, um, gestural marks that were often recognizable. Sometimes they were figurative, sometimes um, they were fragmented bodies, headless torsos, self-rooted, floating, half-human figures that refused to belong, to be fixed, or to be stereotyped. So many, many female iconography started to emerge. Often they would be comical, too dark, resisting categorizations. Perhaps I was responding to my own inability to locate brown South Asian representation in the feminist spaces of 1990s art world and art history books. It was a process of working both from memory as well as the intense study of historical manuscripts. I was not following any particular script of how to respond to my interest in the manuscripts, but to work intuitively. So I was looking at all sorts of different schools, but I was also thinking about the idea of mythology, how myths are crafted and created, what are inner private encounters, dreams, fantasies, all sorts of explorations, poetic and literary sources to really explore feminine power. So repertoire of forms, figures that emerged were sometimes um, I would develop them further, so take very loose ink drawings and embellish them with more forms, sometimes with ink, sometimes with marker pens. And these characters that started to occupy the paintings were often androgynous, sometimes very monstrous, and frequently as a collection of alter egos. Such a dance also opens my recent animation, Reckoning, where two forms mimicking warriors are entangled in joust. 
The animation alludes to the interstices, the transitory, the mythos, that could be of the migrant and the citizen, woman and power, the colonized or the artist, all those, all of us that are caught between worlds, artistic vocabularies, cultures, practices, and histories. So, the, so this in-between space, which is, as I said, is, is very um, generative also, but it, it allowed me to play with broader themes of conflict and tension, ecology, fertility, void, dark matter, things that could be held in some kind of attention. So how we experience art, how we respond to it, and how we interpret it, for me, is a very open-ended premise. As an artist, my intent is to create something wondrous and with many possible associations, something that can generate thought and produce difference. Here, these series, the malign monsters. You see the Indian celestial dancer modeled on a sculpture at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The dancer flirtatiously entwines with a figure drawn from the Italian mannerist painting, an allegory with Venus and Cupid by Bronzino. So these two characters come together they were both outside of the classical Western canon, one being from a mannerist tradition, and perhaps at that time for me to push against the power structures that construct art histories. So I, um, I had entangled both of them, and I had done a drawing primarily. It was, um, it was the banner for the MoMA, but it was also here in this drawing on the left, intimacy. So at that time, which is almost 20 years ago, the ideas were um, more about declaring, you know, like how art histories, classicism, and ethnocentric reactions to Indian art, like in the Winkelmann's doctrine, and how I was how I wanted to make a comment on that, and also to use mannerism as an accomplice witness of this one-sided history. So I had created this, and later what happened, like in 2017, I had the opportunity to be part of the New York City Mayor's Advisory Commission on City Art Monuments and Markers. And during that process, hearing differing public opinions and studying public monuments, and their complicated histories and the tensions between these overt male representations of historical monuments, I thought that my work has always been very much anti-monument. But because of the nature of the work being so small and intimate and like small drawings, nobody ever sees that. So I was like, what if I made my drawing into a sculpture? What would happen? What would be the response? So, I, so that's what I did. I took a small drawing and was able to then play with this idea of um, moving it into a completely new direction. New direction in some way, but almost like for me, it's like looking at the history of my own work and in there are like, you know, ideas that have been uh, sitting there dormant and all I needed to do was pull them out apart and bring them to life. So the same way perhaps in which how I had trained myself to examine the historical manuscripts. So I worked with um, models and uh, also um, through the process of clay into the bronze sculpture. And then um, in 21, in, in the show that was organized by Jan Howard for the RISD Museum uh, that opened at the Morgan Library, I had the opportunity to speak with, the, um, with Gayatri Gopinath, the scholar at NYU, and uh, Gayatri wrote an essay called Promiscuous Intimacy. So the title of this work is borrowed from her essay. 
The sculpture with its sinuous entanglement of the Greco-Roman Venus and the Indian Devata explores the promiscuous intimacies of multiple times, spaces, art historical traditions, bodies, desires, and subjectivities. In their suggestive embrace, the intertwined female bodies bear the symbolic weight of communal identities from across multiple temporal and geographic terrains. So in the same way, this is also trying to explore that in-between space and thinking about histories in a different manner. So when I research historical paintings, I inspire to cultivate new associations for trenchant historical symbols from more than one vantage point, oftentimes employing ideas around time, space, monument, monumentality, movement, and thinking like, how can I come up with new relationships with the past? What, what would occur if, if things moved across um, a, a, across in unexpected ways. So this sort of um, process really comes together through reading and research, but also a lot of it is with engagement with community and careful listening. So this, I wanted to also share with you guys a, a, a new work that I'm making. So, um, I came across these figurative sculptures at the Appellate Division Courthouse in Manhattan in one of my um, researches a few years ago. And then I, two years ago, Madison Square Park uh, invited me to submit a proposal and I thought maybe there was a way to um, engage the courthouse because of its proximity to the Madison Square Park. And I began sketching ideas about a possible relationship between these two locations. So I am making a sculpture which will sit inside the park as well as on the roof of the courthouse. Art and judicial norms are constantly being reevaluated and interpreted in the world. So both embody a dynamic which is alive and tethered to the present moment. So that got me thinking, like how could I think of, of, of um, the visuals that have been employed in the spaces of justice in the courthouse? So the body becomes a powerful tool. So here, um, just quickly mentioning, just bringing a connection here that um, this drawing was basically, it took its inspiration from the stained glass ceiling dome of the Appellate Courthouse. So it's translucency, it's very defined architectural properties. I thought of reimagining the dome as a house a space demarcating a site of renewal, and also how you know, I could transform it through the feminine. So it becomes the hoop skirt of the, of the figure, and it will surround the body, and it will also function as, as its armor and support. But initially, the first drawing that got me started was this particular work. And um, this is, has been a signature image in my practice. Some of the elements on the skirt will be treated with mosaic. Actually, it, on, the, on the metal hoop skirt is the word hava, which means air, atmosphere, to breathe, also means eve. So the mosaic will be, the, the, that, that whole um, text will be in the mosaic. And then the piece will further uh, be animated via an AR lens. As you can see, that work comes back to, um, to work that I have been, you know, it's like the signature image that has been in my work in many, many iterations, but this idea of um, this non-fixed idea of the notion of the body, something very amorphous like the self. So if you look at this image on the right, it's something that can't be fixed. She self-rooted the body. It also represents to me the resilience of women who can carry their roots wherever they go, perhaps suggesting the paradox of rootedness itself. 
questioning also the fallacy of assimilation versus foreignness. And then it becomes, you know, um, a foundational element in so many of the other paintings throughout my um, archive. But I'm not gonna, I'm gonna keep moving and um, perhaps here a little comment here, uh, Pleasure Pillars, where the pageant of archetypes celebrate female sensuality and desire. So uh, this painting was also written about by Gayatri Gopinath, the gender sexuality scholar. And I am reading a quote of her. So after the attacks of 9-11, the work itself further evolved with the addition of jet planes in response to the paternalistic justification for the war in Afghanistan as saving women. So this work points us to the joyous sensual depictions of feminine power. But what I was keen to share was if you look at the image in the center, right, the face with the horns, I, I thought, okay, maybe I, I need to develop that further. And here's a drawing, and here you see um, a work in progress, as, which will be part of the, the sculpture, which will open in January at the Madison Square Park. So um, femininity, to me, is this tension between women and power, how societies perceive such a dynamic, and how often erasure is enacted by the social forces that shape women's lives. So throughout literature, the notion of the female has been in conversation with this invisible, visible divide, the feminine as the monstrous, the abject, the fecund, the immense, the vulnerable, intimacy, selfhood, valor, resistance, and femininity's intersections with race, as well as war, are markers often of the fear that lurks when boundaries melt. So um, another way of looking at this kind of uh, in-between space of gender was another painting here, um, Mind Games, the one on the left, where I have, where I was looking at uh, the Pacha Nama manuscript and um, looking at the Darbar Hall and then the two self-portraits flank a subway map. There's the water tanks in the top margin. It, it's a New York City setting. But in, in there is also, in the center is the Bodhisattva, the deity that for me represented the non-binary and it was a symbol of multitude with the ability to look in all directions and be able to possess any form. So a very chameleon-like character. And that, for me, again, becomes really a powerful metaphor for many sides. How, you know, sometimes sides that are unseen of any narrative. So these concepts take on additional cadence when I start to work in the material of glass. Because glass offers transparency, it also offers an opaqueness through color, while its reflective properties do add movement. So this transparency and separation in these works, there, these are um, mosaic pieces all done in gla glass. They also um, allow me to play with um, the idea of what is fixed and what is fluid. Some of the details here that you can uh, see, I have, when I, initially when I started working with the, with the material of glass and mosaic, it was at the Franz Mir studio in Munich. And uh, the piece that we ended up creating is at the Princeton University. So this, um, as you can see, you know, the works engage with the female in many, many ways. Um, but for me, I often think that it can be the idea of the feminine can also function as a symbol of perhaps resistance or endurance 
to the global histories of empire. So if I can center women in the narratives of my paintings, then perhaps they can take charge of the redemptive powers of the female body as a counter to the extractive forces of global capital. So my interest in that kind of comes around in these um, series of works called The Touchstone, The Golden Diamond, Infinite Women series, but also Land of Tears. In this particular work, you can see at the bottom, you know, um, there is the fem female with, uh, with the skeleton holding on to one another for affirmation and support, perhaps summoning the strength of ancestors. Another work here, you can see the scale of these works, the details. So this um, interest in the ideas of uh, empire, how art follows empire, how there's tension within these concepts of histories, who gets to own history, who gets to represent history, where lies that power, who usually the highest bidder, who gets to um, speak on behalf or gets to tell the story creates that um, hierarchy. And throughout my work, I have, you know, I've always been looking at other artists' productions and um, engaging with community-based spaces like the Project Row Houses in, in Houston when I was living there and working there. And then at times often looking at art history itself, but taking on new narratives, new narratives that might resist the older ones, that may offer new um, incentives, that could look at the world in ways in which that tension comes alive. Here are some examples of um, the different scales in which so much of my drawing um, happens from very intimate scale to the large scales, which are like at 10 feet. And so these, these Christmas trees that you see, that one in the back, here are some details. They were coming from um, the oil rigs that I had researched when creating Parallax. And I did not, did not know that oil rigs were called Christmas trees till then. And I was uh, looking at that, um, the photograph of an oil pumping platform and that, that I'd seen an, in the British Petroleum magazine and I was looking you know, at the branches and the chains as garlands, but this motif has allowed me to really play further and think also in terms of um, our engagement with climate and also in terms of histories, such as like the one over here, the oil and poppies. Of course, it, it kind of looks at the engagement of the um, Afghan-US long-term war. You can look at some of the details here. All of it is done in ink and gouache. So you will see how drawing can take on so many shapes. So in the center is also an animated work. And for me, the, this anchoring of thinking as through the action, through the action of drawing, really allows me to engage uh, with different histories and with literature and poetry. As a visual artist, I think like, you know, I can, think faster through the act of drawing, but perhaps in another lifetime, I, I would want to be a poet or an artist. So I often think like, okay, then perhaps each painting that I'm making is also almost like a, like a poem. And then of course, things that are outside of your control 
are constantly happening and occurring. So I just wanted to add that in there. And going backward in 1998, the New York Times Magazine asked me to imagine a topic that could be a turning point in the next century for the September 1999, imagining the millennium issue. So I created this work, which at that time was um, done before 9-11, so impressive in that way, but it was about war, coalitions, US foreign policy, especially in Muslim countries, who becomes friend, who is a foe, who, where sanctions are imposed, where debt is forgiven, where human rights are brushed under the carpet, how America flexed its military muscle with its vast military bases. And, you know, so the work kind of took into account a lot of that recent history, perhaps to comment again on, on uh, on, the hist on the manuscript tradition as a platform for me to really uh, create a political manuscript. So I made many faces of Islam, yeah, like 20 years ago. And uh, the painting was only reviewed in 2017. So again, you know, as an artist working in this manner, it just tells me you keep making your work because you believe that you, what you're doing is important, but that doesn't mean necessarily that the work that you create is, uh, is going to uh, be seen within the art history or art world of your time. So that, that has always been something that, again, that I think of in terms of the relationship of a contemporary artist and how it's unfolding in a particular art world. So this idea of the manuscript, I wanted to also just show the scale that how I have taken that concept and, and created large scale works. I think one of this is in the Philadelphia Art Museum's collection here. And I do, um, this, this, the direction of this work was started when I did a residency at the Fabric Workshop Museum here as well. So this, this manuscript can offer so much more here. So um, this idea of multi, um, faceted work or things that are transparent or can offer multivalence. Also started with working as a mural painter and then developing um, drawing into the process of painting directly on the wall. So these transparent scrolls, scrolls of paper with fluid, spontaneous gestures that would involve the whole body, amplifying the motifs and iconographies, which were still in conversation with classical traditions, but the nature of the piece evolved because I think my intent was, I didn't want, it to, I didn't want to hide anything. Everything needed to be visible. It needed to be transparent. It needed to flow. And it flows and it moves. And all the marks, including any flaws, become a part of the piece. The piece itself has no borders, and it can expand in any direction, which then marks it as a site that is unstable, as well as, of course, multivalent. So this work was done mostly, I used to do these works in the 90s, but then when I was working with Jan Howard for the show, uh, which was going to sort of look at the um, first 15 years of my practice, everybody wanted, oh, I should do this piece again, or if it had existed in the archives. And I, I, and I it didn't because in that time, there was no ownership attached to these drawings. I would create the drawings and then, you know, I would exchange them with other artists or people who had helped me in the process of making these large scale murals. So this is, uh, this work is being done at, this is at the RISD Museum. This was in, at the Maxi Museum. And, um, which brings me to uh, another work, 
which has traveled around the world, but which originated here at the Philadelphia Art Museum, Disruption is Rapture, which uh, is, it, it is um, um, in their permanent collection, but it also comments on one of the manuscripts within the museum's collection. And um, the animation, I think, is open to public, so you can see it there. So even when I was looking at the book itself, which is in the vitrine, right? And then its uh, facsimile is available where you can look through it. But it was in, in um, Dakani Urdu, over 5,000 or three or 4,000 verses, so no translation. How do you read a synopsis offered by the museum about the summary of the story? while there are 4,000 verses. So for me, it was like, I cannot follow that particular story. I am going to respond to the illustrations um, more intuitively. And that's how this piece was created, it was looking at broad representations about um, human strife and struggle. But I also was aware that the work was um, created, you know, it's like a Hindu love story recast as a Sufi tale. So the love story does emerge as a metaphor for soul's search for and connection with the divine. So the plural spirit of the historical work, it's central India, so it has both Hindu Muslim histories. So I thought of that and thought that it, the plur plurality had to take center stage. So the piece has motion graphics, South Asian lyrical poetry, Western opera, orchestral music, Indian ragas, Gregorian chants. But all of that was handled by my collaborator, the composer Duyan. But in its animated form, in, is also in high resolution 4K, which gave the piece a lot more elasticity so that we were able to scale it up and show it in multiple situations and sites around the world and it can exist outside the confines of the museum and across the globe. And I thought that for me has always been like how to get the, the manuscript which is deeply buried and hidden in the archives of a Western institution and how can I have access to it? And then how can I share that? So, so that's the beauty of, of uh, working on this particular work that I was invited to engage with the manuscript, but eventually the work can exist you know, in so many different ways as well. And um, so this, engagement with, uh, with animation, where drawing functions as the libretto. Parallax was inspired, uh, it was created for the Charge Art Biennial in 2013, but it was really inspired by my drive and journey through the landscape of the UAE and the research that I was able to create during that, those months and a year. So I wanted to again bring the interest in colonial histories to the forefront. So the, his, the movement of objects and bodies that are very much in, related to um, maritime trade and migration and um, migratory labors. So all, all of those um, elements kind of come about through the nature of drawing such as these which as I was making this particular work, I was scanning its different layers. Here you can see its scale, and here you can see it in a still of the animation. So drawing again, you know, allows the, the animated works to happen, but for me, the hand has to be really present in the, in the film as well. It's, I, I don't like, any software to to come 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 to the surface. So there's always this struggle behind the scenes in terms of how to use drawing, but still have have time being captured within the within the painting, within the 
piece itself. So here is one example where the animation is playing. There's, there's obviously a group of people sitting there. But when I think of, of this particular still, it's basically oil, which is um, created from these millions of little hair particles. So oil is oozing out of all the perceived orifices, the cracks in the gouache, the armature, which is of the animation. But when I started to equate ink with oil, then oil with movement, movement with time, time with history, and history with hierarchy, I realized that I was linking material with matter, drawing with thinking, and power with natural resources. So suddenly, you know, the nature of drawing can take on so much more. And that, for me, is such an exciting idea, an exciting moment as an artist. In parallax, oil is malleable. It can shift form. Emulating the gopi hair silhouettes, the animated drips, the swarming of the ocean, the migratory patterns of the singing spheres, the cascading liquef liquefied hair particles. So it is also that iteration of the chalava that how I see this concept, which basically again translates to somebody who is so swift in their movement that you can never get a hold of them. You can't anger them. You can't box them. And that, for me, is this idea of the poltergeist. The score of the work was, again, created in collaboration with the poets in Sharjah and the composer. And everybody participated and you know, created um, a, a, a beautiful landscape, which is both kind of an emotional cartography uh, very present in the piece. Oftentimes, what would happen would be that the composer would perform live the score. And for me, this, this collaborative nature of the work, that the work can allow other people to have autonomy within my work, was like a true iteration of what collaboration is, where everybody gets um, to be present. And it's not you know, under any particular hierarchy of, of the visual artist or the artist. So um, this work was very cinematic, very horizontal. And then I thought, what if I turned it upside down? What would happen? How would that change the entire dynamic? So ecstasy as sublime, heart as vector, occurs in that moment. It's scroll-like format that can be traced all the way to my first painting, you know, the, the scroll from the 80s. And unrolling it in a vertical manner, here it's over 66 feet. But it's stacked up compositional structure, allowed for an interplay of color, shape, form, and Again, a multiplicity of perspectives that allowed the eye to move upward. So it goes all the way to the, from the uh, ground floor of the building to the ceiling. And um, all of it is in mosaic. And there is um, the reference to mirage is, is present there. And um, you know, for me, mirage represents a spiritual conceptualization of faith and trust. So I've been interested in this motif's representation, primarily because it's a very salient theme in Indo-Persian manuscript painting as well. But here, the light changes its nature a lot. So at night, when during the daylight, when it picks up light, the reflective white gold almost pops the image and it feels as if it's moving upward. And at night, when there's less light, it sort of recedes back into the composition. So here are uh, just 
some visuals of the process of working. All the drawings were made to scale. They are almost like 12, 14 feet. But the, the initial ideas have also happened in quick sketches like the one on the right, which is the usual, you know, small 12 inch page. So another work at, the, uh, at Princeton is the quintuplet effect, which here you see the drawing. And uh, let me get to the, to the actual work, which is in glass. But there are many different um, characters in this work, just pointing out to Adam Smith, who is also embedded in there. But he's trapped in the East India Company's attire, fashioned in the company school of miniature painting which emerged in India under the colonial rule. His lofty ideas have grown wings, but he is entrapped in luminous glass, unable to fly. The idea being that we are still caught in the same old patterns of inequities of wealth. So you can see how the drawing creates this whole um, scene, which then animates and creates some Tension because it's sitting in the hall in the in the economics building at Princeton. So the uh, you know the, these um, elements which uh, which I see are throughout my work. If I if I think of them through text, here is an example: a spontaneous response to a difficult situation, or stalemate. So here, so many other, th it's not just a play, because I enjoy tight, the titling works and enjoy the play with language. But here also is engaging with geometry and again, an understanding of Islamic geometry. And then, you know, being able to create the stalemate through the geometry, through the math. So it's again drawing that goes into the direction of mathematics as well. Here drawing becomes more about writing, rote learning, practice makes perfect. So as I was writing, I, the ink was dripping and as the ink started to drip, it almost became like a rhythmic pattern and the repetition of the phrase from Ghalib's poem, or um, from one of the ghazals, and then that's repeated, and in its repetition, the question becomes a statement, and the statement get, becomes a question again. Quickly sharing that these concepts were also played out in different places. So I have not really shared this work a lot, but I did create a film which looked at um, the Pakistani army's history of, of playing music and the patriotic songs. And then in Bending the Barrels, they also ended up playing um, love ballads uh, for me. And so this Bending the Barrels really became about that kind of shift from the history of the patriotic songs into something which became like evocative and personal to each um, composer and musician. While um, doing these um, thought processes that take shape in animation and through, uh, through scaling up and doing wall drawings. I was also, you know, I keep looking. So here is another example of looking at the Bacha Nama and what, how that inspired me to create The Last Post. So The Last Post is a film which can, again, um, which looks at the history of East India Company between India and China and it also plays on the concept of the 
bugle call, which is the title, the last post. It actually refers to the bugle call, commemorating the soldiers who die in war, but it also signals an end of sorts, kind of the end perhaps, or the collapse of the Anglo-Saxon hegemony over China. So the protagonist in there is the East India Company, man who appears in various guises throughout the piece, but often as a lurking threat in the imperial rooms of the Mughal Empire. And then it's a um, style of working that I, I engaged with was very much looking at the company school of painting. In here are so certain motives that have taken on, you know, much more greater significance and I've seen how they can um, move from the drawings into um, other kind of meaningful spaces like the idea of the spinning arms, the broken forearm with the clenched hand. All iterations of struggle, fear, terror, might, control, loss of power, fate. So they may be borrowed from a multitude of references from, you know, from going all the way in drawings of Vishwarupa, encompassing infinite aspects of creation versus um, and the, the piece also operating in parallax. But in this particular instance, I also was work, I, I was doing research and then came across this abandoned cinema where the, one of the, the, the person living in the abandoned theater in Khor Fakan, uh, UAE, was a Pakistani migrant worker who had come to UAE in 1976 and his visa was still attached to the building in 2012. So I meet him and he and I, you know, intersect in this crazy moment where I was curious about the space and he was actually living inside in this abandoned, broken down um, theater. And he gave me a tour and hosted me and I did this, um, perhaps the last piece for the caretaker. So this, this was part of my research that lend, ended up for Parallax and he becomes the protagonist in Parallax. So just sharing again that the research itself is not just you know, looking at the manuscripts or looking in the collections in the museums, but also research with people, with movement, with different locations and sites. And um, for me, this, this keeps you know, the whole work and the process of thinking alive. And um, just a few more images and I will end here. This, is, uh, the, this was um, the Gopi crisis where the idea of the disjointed removed hair or the, 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 the hair of the female that is functioning as a particle system. So it has been coded to create these choreographed movements that mimic the people that are in Times Square. But in its original sort of isolated form, it is really the hair of these characters. So here you can see how the bodies disappear and just the hair is left. And then that image allows me to build it through code into these um, movements. And that, that, that kind of, that's perhaps one way of entering into animation also in some of the earlier animations, especially like Pursuit Curve, which also looked at this movement through the, uh, through, uh, through the representation of headgear, again, things that are heavily saturated and full of, of particular kind of symbols of meaning, but they can be transformed. So the turbans become the butterflies, but you don't know what they are till they settle down and then you realize, oh, 
that's where the element came from. And, that, and I'm drawing that connection here too, that this notion of the, of the micro into the macro and something which is in your hand and the thought or the text or the gesture, it's so detailed and here it's always, you know, the target is always moving. So this piece also is created by just writing and it's both in English and Urdu. So for me, art really lives. Art survives, it's messy, it inspires, it is complicated, it is very much like life. But the best aspect um, that I can think of about art is that it is also about knowledge construction. How we reckon with our otherness in a shifting world, how we approximate, reproduce, and reenact our culture and history. Whatever we make, whatever we consume, and give back, it has resonance and consequence beyond our immediate lives. Because history itself is effectively an account of the movement of objects and bodies, trade, slavery, migration, colonial occupation, all underlying currents, the root axis of modernity, how history is told, who gets to tell it, it exposes the hierarchies of power in our world. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. That was um, it's just remarkable. I'm always in awe of uh, just how um, broad, just how much work there is and how broad it is uh, in terms of subject matter, in terms of um, um, medium, in terms of size. Um, in um, and I just and, and and what I find also sort of absolutely remarkable is the way that you've actually. It's so obvious, I think, through through everything you do, or you've done, um, how this kind of the the constant kind of uh, reference to tradition, traditions of essentially manuscript painting and manuscript calligraphy and all these sorts of things, which you bring out and just rework and rework and make meaningful in so many different ways and media. Um, that I, it just it's it, it's absolutely remarkable. I I could go on asking you specific questions about specific pieces of art and, and uh, several, um, um, and just a lot of things. But um, one thing, we have very limited time, I was just told extremely limited time. So um, I just have, um, I just want to start out with one question. You actually made a reference. Um, you said that, you know, in another life you might have wanted to be a poet. Um, and also, because I also know that in your work you actually, you do read poetry. You, mentioned, you, you made references to it, you read Ghalib, you read Adrian Rich. I mean, it's like basically that you do read poetry and you're inspired in various ways uh, to make meaning through it. So would you be willing to talk a bit more about that? Yeah, so what I love about poetry is that it captures time and it remains timeless. And um, even it's uh, the, the armature or the structure that poets use in, the, in their choice of words and how, um, how that inspires me to create a painting. Okay. I often, you know, I, I like to create works that are not just repetitive. So it's never been like, oh, this is a niche, and now I just have to like keep reproducing. Mm -hmm. Because that is a very real pressure in yeah. the art world. Yeah. You have a niche and you're known for it and then you keep you know, making it. So I, that's one thing. It's like the poets, the, when I look at the uh, different works of different poets, there is a continuity and yet every poem is different. So I've always thought that you know, if I started to think of poetry as a parallel to my practice, it might allow me to really 
articulate and think of my work differently. And these are, these are, um, these are episodes that happen because one was frustrated mm -hmm. to always be boxed in terms of just identity or whatever was the mm -hmm. hip topic of the day. <laughs> if it was nation, if it was diaspora, if it was identity, if it was gender, if all of that's very valid, right? But then it tends to, um, you know, place people, definitely artists of color, in those, in those boxes, and then you're expected to just perform within those um, constructs. And if you try to do something else, you're, you are punished. That's you know? So, so I, I think many of these are, are ideas that, that come about because you're thinking, OK, um, there's a fetishization that happens. I'm, I'm looking at the manuscripts, but then it's always been, oh, it's like your work is just, you're a miniaturist. Mm -hmm. Whatever that means, I welcome all different types of um, of uh, descriptions of an artist, but you know it tends to box you, yeah. and not that you're always just reacting just for the nature of of reacting. But I think you're you if you're making art, you have to really think every day. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's hard. It's hard. You have to really wake up every day, and you're like, "Oh, why am I painting? Like, what what is what is it that compels me to make art?" And so many times, it's always a crisis. Like, oh, I don't even know what to do. <laughs> Amazing. So you know, so this there is that ethos in poetry that that captures or crystallizes a moment in in our human emotions in, in human history and society, how society is changing and shifting and transforming, like it crystallizes that moment. And then you can read a poet 50 years later and you experience that. And I think that that's been kind of, I don't know if I can articulate it well, but that's what draws me about how to draw a parallel with, with poetry. That's very interesting. So I then... Um I mean, I wanted to actually ask you about, because the movement to sculpture, it brings up so many, because now it's like, you know, again, you were talking about being in a niche and, and everything, and it's not your niche, the sculpture, and then what you're doing now, and, uh, but you're being recognized, I mean, it's like you're being, you're getting a, it's going to be a major thing in New York City. Um, and you're also in this, in, in not only is it sort of, it's your, the art, the use of new, you're using new media in terms of like, you know, new plastics. You were telling me about how the sculpture is going to be made in new technological ways um, and all these sorts of things. So it's all very interesting. But I think just, and, uh, but to, in, I just want to change topics because of the, the theme is heritage and there are important questions about heritage. So one question is that um, it, uh, despite this, you know, you're born in Lahore, you're educated in Lahore, uh, you work in stuff that is always referential to, um, to that part of the world, um, uh, and at the same time, certain, um, in certain circles and certain critics, et cetera, have, um, don't consider you a Pakistani artist. Well, that's on them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but there you have more to say on that. I know that. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. So let me just first try to explain. I think there's a really good essay in the book by Sadia Abbas. Yes. Yes. She takes on this topic, and I, I think she says it very powerfully. But for me, I've always said that I wanted to look at the archives. And the archives, definitely, when I was young and in Pakistan and hadn't yet traveled outside of the country, I was like, oh, the archives in India. There's so much material that we will never get to see. You couldn't get the visa, whatever. You, even if you got the visa, you couldn't go and live there and make um, an apprenticeship with other artists or dig around into the materials. So from there, it was like, OK, how do you access the things that sit in storages at the Met, for example. Mm -hmm. How? You, you have to physically be there, <laughs> physically be present. So for me, 
My work references, articulates, examines, and looks at material that some of it has not even been archived. So if it hasn't been archived, it technically is a ghost. It doesn't exist because there's more money for Western manuscripts, mm -hmm. European manuscripts in an institution. Even take Morgan Library. They have some wonderful um, Persian Indian manuscripts, but perhaps they're West, they are well known for the West and they have better collections, larger collections, but they perhaps did not have the, they had the support, but maybe the money to be allocated to bring the entire Indo-Persian manuscripts digitally available. You know, so again, there is a large amount of material that resides in these museums that um, never sees. We never know about it. How, if that, that, that motivates me, that's home. Locating that, understanding its provenance, its history, uh, identifying and then in being inspired by it. It was never going, going to happen by just, you know, in a, in, a, in a place where I would have no access to it. So that's what I wanted to clarify, that the work is connected to, um, to those objects, to those paintings, and to the way they have been talked about in 19th century Eurocentric Mm -hmm. uh, art historical language mm -hmm. and how they have been severed and mm -hmm. circulated and the problematics, the colonial legacy of things that have been dispersed. Mm -hmm. how, how is that about being a Pakistani? Like, I'm, t I'm talking about that in my work. I'm not talking about um, that I have, that that I have to be in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. What I have, I grew up in Pakistan, what I have is inherent. It's always going to be there. It's, not gonna ta it's never going to come away. Plus, the, I, I think it's also very hypocritical that the art world, with all its art fairs around the globe, is the same group of people that circulate around the globe all year round. <laughs> It, they, the art fair in India or the uh, Lahore Biennial in Pakistan, you know, all these things are circulating the same econ, same, similar crowd and um, power dynamics. Probably in more recent years and less so in the 90s. But in the 90s, you know, if I had, if I had, if the if the internet was there, if, if I was an artist born in the 90s and working now, I would probably not. I would be very happy elsewhere, outside of where I am, because you can be positioned globally elsewhere yeah. equally. In fact, in Asia, is, is probably much better for artists. I, I always advise my younger students that um, move, to, move to Asia. There's, a, there's so much dynamic that's going between Asian countries. And as Asian art artists, you don't want to be you know, um, deprived of that. So, so of course, there's time and um, context to this question, yeah. but, um, but I find it very, of course it's upsetting, but I find it amusing and self-serving. Well, and also it sort of, it has this absolutely simplistic notion of what constitutes heritage and identity and all these sorts of issues, because as you said, I mean, it's not, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, like yeah. young, I saw yeah. a young students in Pakistan that had that had never really seen more than ten manuscript paintings, and they said, "Oh well, we are being told that's not necessary. We have to make contemporary miniature." So if you're not going to engage with the historical, mm -hmm. then how do you, you know, create a link to the vast dispersed historical material? I, I personally believe it's very important to physically encounter it. Because when I see it physically, it's, um, I, I, I feel its energy. Mm -hmm. It's what drew me to the motif of mirage. That the motif is powerful. It's not just a, a graphic image. It has something else. And that's 
perhaps, you know, why I engage with poetry or with uh, the manuscript tradition's relationship to a Sufi mm -hmm. philosophy and Sufi history is that there's something beyond the object. It's something else that is trapped there. And you, as an artist, really, you do feel like, okay, the color is so vibrant. It looks as if it was just painted a minute ago. And it's so different. You do, you, it's almost like a dead image if you look in a, manu, in a book. So, so there, that's another topic altogether. But I think, um, you know, there, there are no um, severe lines, like going back and forth, going having family in Pakistan, going there. So it's never been like this idea of living in exile or mm -hmm. being yep. out of the culture. I think our, our, there's, a, there's a culture which is, as I said, the in-between culture that almost all of us carry within whatever we do. And that, that is what really excites me the most, is less about, about saying, you know, somebody in Pakistan is more authentic versus the diaspora being less authentic. Or the Dubai diaspora being more authentic than the, some <laughs> other diaspora. The, um, so one last question, which relates to things that you've said um, a lot here uh, that come up is um, that, uh, so I mean, you know, the, the issue of how um, the art of certain parts of the world and, and it, the history of those places uh, that you are interested in your work on, um, about how they end up being framed within a colonial or a post-colonial kind of whatever imperialist lens, if you want to call it even. Um, and also how the artwork, can, how art world can somehow be, sometimes be a, a club, you know. Um, so um, do you think those, um, those problems have featured in something that I've always found remarkable is that it's been a long time that you've been a very successful and well-known artist. You got a MacArthur in 2006. Um, and it's only what now that you've had your first solo show in New York City. Yeah. Because I think, um, sorry to harp on the female aspect, that, yeah. but definitely, you know, um, there's, there is a much more diminished support for women artists in general mm -hmm. across institutions, and uh, I don't know, I think it's 20 or less, 17% women that get solo exhibitions in museums. So that's a very low number. So there's that. And um, I also think, again, because I was um, not being a good girl and painting the paintings that I was supposed to make, <laughs> I was doing things that, you know, that took me outside of the commercial art world. Mm -hmm. So there was, uh, so it's like, oh, where's Shazia? Oh, is she still making art? Because if you did not have gallery representation, especially as a female, then you're like almost invisible. But you're still making your art. You're making things. You may be showing them outside of the U.S. or elsewhere, but, but you were actively making work. And that's one of the other, I think, elements that possibly um, led to it, because um, you know, now it's, in this moment, looking backward, even the two, three years, it neutralizes it perhaps to some degree, but it's been a, it's been a theme with many other um, artists, friends of mine, um, that, that used to warn me also. You know, early, like my first few shows were, it, they happened really fast. I, a few years out, out, out of graduate school. Mm -hmm. so, so at that time, you don't think 15 years later, right? I wish I had better guidance then, then too. <laughs> but that's why I think it's very important to engage with the youth and, you know, talk about all of these dynamics, I think. Um, the, the inequality in the art world. But post 9-11, capital shifted also to Asia. There's, you know, centers of art making centers around the world. And, mm -hmm. and, um, and so it, things started to sort of, the representations started to become more diverse. 
So there is that. But art history definitely remains very Eurocentric. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that will probably take a longer time as more people start to contribute and write about art and more, um, more the expert, there's not just one expert on Pakistani art, there are more people writing about it. All of these things take time. Excellent. Let me see what time, oh, I know that, uh, I don't know how many people have watched Night in the Museum, but there's a chance that if we go too long, we'll be standing, in the, you know, we'll be here. But, um, but yes, yeah, so let me open, let's have some questions from the people. There's one question right there. Hi, is this working? Um, thank you so much, first of all. This was very interesting. Um, secondly, I... Is the echo really bad? Okay. Okay, um, I know you said you don't want to harp on the female thing too much, but it is clearly like a common uh, motif throughout your work, and I was just wondering, what is it that led you to start creating um, pieces that center around femininity and this um, this way of thinking of femininity that I think like especially I don't know nudity and the female form and all of these things are probably not as easily accepted into some of our Eastern cultures um, or our Western cultures to be honest um, so I'm wondering how you came to that there's a lot of manuscript paintings that have nudity. <laughs> so uh, it's less, I don't think um, the work is really about, about the female body and its nude um, facet. It's, if you're talking about the sculpture, I think I tried to explain that the sculpture really was about taking um, an Indian and Mannerist histories as, as both outsiders of the classical Western canon. And as outsiders, what was their um, one-sided kind of power history? So mannerism as being the outsider impulse of classic, classical art. So in that respect, the protagonist is Venus from the particular painting. So I'm taking that and um, it's the feminine form. but. You know, um, I guess being a female and gravitating towards a lot of female poets, authors, understanding how um, the, the, the subject matter of femin female subject matter in art history, how, how it has also been talked about and how to open it, how to talk. Also, not like for me, it's not just female as in opposition to male, it's a much more fluid aspect of the feminine too, as, uh, as in so much of the language, like right here, where I'm, you know, this is literally ink and brush, like the relationship of gesture on paper that led, that gave birth to this form. You can think of it in terms of nudity, but it's very stylized and also really kind of mythic. It's, um, it's about erasure. It's also about being self-rooted, carrying your roots with, within, within yourself. A very buoyant image. It's, it's, uh, it's not an image of uh, victimhood. It's an image that is always rising and floating and you know, it can choose to root itself wherever. Here, it was literally a projection into space. At the Shangri-La, the Doris Duke Foundation Shangri-La, the Islamic Art Center there. And this is uh, the image falling as a light on landscape, on trees. So almost like a light tattoo. That's how I thought of it. And um, this is just a slow... Uh, um, a, 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 vis, a documentation, a slow exposure of the event that gave it so much um, sharpness. But, so I think a lot of the feminine forms in my work play with this, with the body as, um, as it's never realistically rendered other than the image in the sculpture. Not that 
I'm take either or, but just sharing that there's so much to this, the ethos of the female that, you know, as, um, as a, something which, is, which allows me to imagine the form in endless ways. And, you know, as an artist, you hold on to things that, that you haven't solved. So if you haven't solved it, it keeps coming in and out and occurring. But, but as I said earlier, also, that, that it's almost like a redemptive space. The feminine is redemptive as a counter to something which is about taking and which is extractive. The feminine is about giving. So it's the counter to the extractiveness. Mic is coming. You can, can don't you don't need to start again. You can keep going. So about your poetry, Giriftare <laughs> Chaman, about freedom and captivity. So I really want to know: is it any personal reference to it or any inspiration to that? Yes. So uh, that particular phrase came to me when I was hanging around in that abandoned theater with the uh, with with the caretaker and I could not get over the fact that his visa was attached to the building which was about to be or whatever imminent death of the building and I was like well, what is this labor of love for him it was his labor of love and I, I kept thinking life's labor lost and I was struggling with this because, you know, I, was, I wanted to understand, like, what happens when you come in 1976 and then when the building demolishes and your visa is attached to, physically to the architecture of the building, are you sent back to Pakistan? Is that, or what, what, what does this mean in terms of the issues of migrant labor? But his, like, he was incredibly happy and wonderful and, very much that was his that was his home and you know i i met so i thought of the, that tension literally in that site in that location but of course i gravitated to that particular phrase of ghalib is because these are tensions that you know that are so pertinent to to being an artist too as an artist you think you have so much freedom you're you're exploring this idea of freedom, but you know you're not any different from anybody else. So, so this idea, so there is that tension, um, which the power of that phrase captures. Actually, we're very much out of time, according to the IT people. Okay. So, well, thank you so thank much you. for this. Thank you. Really appreciate it. And thank you all for coming. And.